Good morning, committee, and welcome to members of the public. Joining us today, this is the 13th of October 2022 meeting of the Western and Southern Area Planning Committee, which is one of the three area-based planning committees of Dorset Council. Our area remat remit covers the previous Weymouth and Portland Borough Council and most of the previous West Dorset District Council areas. The planning committee is not a public meeting, but a meeting to which the public are invited. All attendees must comply with the ruling of the chair. They must not interrupt the meeting or cause undue disturbance. To support this, please switch off your mobile phones. We're just about to do. <clears throat> and select an, or select silent mode for the duration of the meeting. Members of the public are allowed to record or film any part of the meeting. However, they should conform to the protocol for filming and audio recording of public council meetings and not distract the proceedings. Those filming should only focus on those directly involved in the conduct of the meeting. No fire alarm test is expected. If the fire alarm sounds, can all present leave the building as quickly as possible by way of the closest exit and follow the directions to the nearest assembly point away from the civic offices. Public amenities can be located within the foyer of County Hall, adjacent to the main entrance. Members of the public who have given advance notice of their wish to speak on an application will be invited to address the committee for a maximum of three minutes. No material is to be circulated to members of the committee. For the benefit of the public, my name is Councillor David Shortell, Chairman of this Area Planning Committee, and my Vice Chairman is Councillor Bill Pipe. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, members and members of the public. Introducing <coughs> other members of the committee, Councillor Dave Barwell. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Good morning, Kelvin. Councillor Susan Cocking. Good morning, Susan. Good morning. Good morning to you. Councillor Jean Danseth. Good morning, Jean. Uh, Councillor Nick Arling. Good morning, Nick. Not here. Okay. Uh, Councillor Paul Kimber. Good morning, Paul. Not here. Councillor Louis O'Leary. Good morning, Louis. Councillor Kate Weller. Councillor Sarah Williams. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning to you. And Councillor John Worth. Good morning, John. Officers, officers involved in the meeting include Anne Collins, Area Manager, Western and Southern Team, Katrina Trevitt, Team Leader, Matthew Pokin Hawkes, Lead Project Officer, Emma Telford and Bob Burden, Senior Planning Officers, Philip Crowther, Lawyer, Elaine Tibble and Joshua Kennedy, Democratic Services. Welcome, Joshua, to your first meeting. I hope you join and keep us in order. And Steve Savage and Guy Tetley of Highways will be attending virtually. Good morning to you both. Apologies. To confirm any apologies for absence, I've got one apology on my list, uh, Councillor Kate Weller. Is there any others, please? Uh, Councillor Kate Weller, Dorset Thank you for that. Item two on the agenda is a declarations of interest. Does any member have any declarations of pecuniary or other conflict of interest, bias or predetermination regarding any item on the agenda? Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Thank you, Chair. I've been advised that I'm predetermined on items 5C, 5D and 5H. Um, I will be sitting over in the public section during that debate, um, but I have arranged to speak as ward member for item 5C, Waitrose application. Thank you, Cameron. Do we have any other beacon interests? Councillor O'Leary. Uh, yes, Chairman, I am predetermined on the item involving the land north of Littlemore Road, 
um, as I've spoken against it at this committee and at town council committee meetings, and therefore I won't be participating in the debate or the vote, but I'll be speaking as the ward member. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. I've duly noted that. Dave, Councillor Dave Burwell. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as, as Chair of Report Town Council Planning Committee, um, I've obviously seen items 5C, 5D and 5H uh, before. Um, I'm predetermined on 5C. I have an open mind on 5D and 5H, but um, for, I think it may be best if I declare predetermination on those, and I will also not vote or talk on those um, applications. Thank you. Hold for a moment. Thank you for that. Any, any other? Oh, Sarah. Sarah, uh, Councillor Sarah Williams. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, um, uh, Councillor Tower, Tower, um, for information. Councillor Roland Tower, the warden member for Winterbourne and Broadmain. Thank you for that. Chairman. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Item three on the agenda is to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 4th of August, 2022. Has all members received a copy of those minutes? Yes, Chairman. Thank you. If members are content, I will sign those minutes as a true record of what took place. We will now take item four on the agenda, and that's public participation. Only those people who have registered to speak with democratic services will be invited to address the committee. The order of speaking will normally be the first three in objection and the first three in support, including the applicant or agent. If a ward councillor who is not a member of the committee wishes to address the meeting, they will be allowed three minutes to do so. Neither the objectors or supporters will normally be questioned except to clarify points of fact by the chairman. All written statements received by democratic services have been passed to members prior to this meeting. Now, at this point, we have a Councillor David Ricard, leader of Bridport Town Council, who wishes to join the meeting online to speak about item 5C in the agenda. 
Over to um, uh, Councillor uh, Rickard. You have three minutes. Uh, Councillor Rickard, you, uh, you look to be muted at the moment. Can you unmute, please? You're still, you're st <laughs> could we could we address that problem please? Councillor Rickard. Yeah, he's, he's asked for it to be read out. Yeah. Do we have the words here? Okay. Right. Please. Do you want to tell him that? Yeah, he, was, he, he did actually <laughs> on his notice exactly who he wished to speak on his behalf. <laughs> Ask him again. Uh, Councillor Rickard, who would you like to... Uh, read out your, your, your comments. Who would you like? We couldn't see it from your uh, note you presented to us on screen. Dave Bowell. Dave Bowell. Okay. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rickard. We'll we'll see what we can do for that. Might it not be a bit more relevant if it were read out before the the item that they're talking about? I believe it's the. The Waitrose in Dorchester, in Bridport, because by then we might have forgotten. Yes, I did bring that point up actually, uh, uh, Councillor Dan South, and uh, it was noted that in fact he could only join us during this particular item on the agenda. Councillor Bellwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, presentation to Dorset Planning Committee uh, from Dave Rickard. Good morning, I'm Councillor Dave Rickard, leader of Bridport Town Council, and I wish to talk in favour of planning application f 5C on your agenda, work to the rear of Waitrose in Bridport, supporting our planning committee's unanimous support for this application. In the Dorset Council Officer's report, the only antagon antagonistic, uh, antagonist to permission is on character and heritage, there is, however, widespread support for this application on the grounds of principles of the development, the amenity and the economic benefits and access and parking. The conservation officer's recommendation for refusal refers to the proposal would result in less than substantial harm to the character and appearance of the Bridport conservation area, which would not be outweighed by any public benefit. Firstly, if it is less than substantial harm, then it is, in our judgment, only a minor harm but in judging whether it is acceptable, then the extent of the public benefit needs to be measured and compared. Bridport businesses have witnessed and struggled to survive the changes in shopping patterns caused by the pandemic, and we, the Town Council, support this application as it will enable a key town centre store to respond to those changes by offering click and collect and more home delivery. It has been made clear that the failure to provide these services will jeopardise the store's future in Bridport. The improvements will also enable the Town Council to reduce in congestion in front of Waitrose on West Street by moving two taxis to the rear of that shopping area, thus providing a choice of pickups. The home delivery option will also reduce car use within the town and provide a valuable public service and improve access to many people currently handicapped by the lack of local public transport in the area. The Conservation Officer also does not mention the benefits of the provision of electric vehicle points 
but does consider wooden fencing to be inappropriate. In our opinion, the proposed wooden fencing would be a visually softer structure and one with a lower carbon footprint than that suggested. The conservation officer also appears to suggest that there is already space for taxis and Waitrose vans in the car park. This is untrue and should not be considered as a, as a factor in the decision made. If the implication is that these facilities could be provided within the car park area, this, was also, this would also impact the viability of Dorset Council's own car park. Good point. This application is for an open utility extension to a modern and un unlisted commercial building by extending its functional outside space into the one piece within its uh, curtilage, which has been left derelict and hitherto unused for many years. Whilst we recognise that the site area sits in the broader conservation area, this small site is already dominated by Dorset Council's own 150 plus space car park, which unsurprisingly has no heritage value whatsoever. The reference therefore to policies D8 and HT2 in the neighbourhood plan are, in our opinion, not relevant. In addition, the site has been left for decades to deteriorate and this relatively minor development will produce a significantly improved condition enhancing the visual setting to the uh, peripheral heritage assets. The Town Council is very protective of our own special town and do not in any way support inappropriate development. We do, however, recognise the community value of this application and support it on the basis that the public benefit clearly outweighs the very minor perceived harm. We hope that your committee does too. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor Bell. Thank you very much. Right, committee, we now take item, uh, item five on the agenda, uh, planning applications. We have seven planning applications before us today for consideration. A comfort break of five or ten minutes will be taken as or when is requested. Councillor Louis O'Leary, as you've uh, noted your predetermination and your desire to speak on this particular item, could I ask you please to move, vacate your chair in the committee and seat, sit within the public area. Thank you. We'll now take item 5A on the agenda, application number PRES 2021-04983, land to the north of Littlemore Road, Weymouth. This is for the application for approval and reserve matters for access, layout, scale, appearance and landscaping of 500 dwellings and associated works in relation to outline application WDD 16-000739 and WP 16-00253 OUT. I now invite Matthew Polk and Hawkes, the case officer, to introduce this, introduce this item. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Chair. This application is the first reserve matters application at Littlemore Road for 500 homes. As you can see from the description, the outline also includes employment land, a school and a local centre. This reserve matters application is just for the residential element. It's a complex scheme, so I'm going to try and keep this as concise as possible given the detailed report. The reserve matters site is shown in red on this plan. The wider Littlemore Urban Extension site, which is allocated in the local plan, is shown in blue. The site crosses the former West Dorset and Weymouth and Portland boundaries, and the majority falls within Binkham, a small area falling within Weymouth Ward. Um, the topography of the site slopes gently upwards. You can see the contours on this plan to the north. This plan shows an aerial view of the site, and just to point out, there's the dairy farm in the centre. This falls outside of the application site boundary. There is Littlemore Road running along the southern boundary of the site. Littlemore local centre, the existing local centre, is on the south of that road. We have a play area on the south side of Louvers Road, and the Lodmore Sands development is located here. Here are some views across the site just to get an appreciation of the hedge lines and the topography of the site. So the first view 
shows a view looking south across the site from this location. You can see the farm in the centre of the site and Littlemore Road and the conurbation in the distance. The second view looks along the boundary, the northern boundary here, and you can see the, it's actually looking from this location, um, you can see the hedge line and the farm in the distance. The third view shows Littlemore Road, what is a shared cycle pedestrian path on the north side of the road and the mature hedge along the northern boundary. This plan shows the eastern boundary of the site looking in this location. You can see again the dense hedge along the eastern side and the field that is the site. This looks across the road and you've got a little more road there and the, you can appreciate the topography there slopes upward. So outline plan of permission that was granted in 2020 for mixed-use development of the entire Littlemore site. This establishes the principle of development. A number of approved parameter plans were approved at the outline stage and these guide the reserve matters that we're looking at today. A planning condition on the outline permission requires that the reserve matters are informed by the parameter plans and the illustrative master plan. So I'm just going to run through those parameter plans now. This parameter plan shows the land uses and the colours show the, the different types of land uses across the site. In orange, we have the residential area, which broadly aligns with the reserve matters application. In light green is the school site, which falls outside of the reserve matters. In pink is the eight hectare employment area, and within, within that is an orange hatched area, which is the local centre. Again, those areas fall outside of the scope of this reserve matters application. Green is the open space and yellow are some of the roads which, which go through the site. There is also this small green spot is a neat a play area approved as part of the outline. This is the building heights parameter plan. It establishes building heights of two and three storeys on the residential land and up to four storeys in the employment area. So you can see the darker, the darker area here is up to three storeys and in the corner of the site outside of this reserve matters is a four-storey um, corner and they are the maximum um, maximum heights allowed under the parameter plans. So some, yeah, you have some three-storey buildings along this east-west road and the parameter plan doesn't set a requirement for single-storey buildings within the red residential area. The rest is two storeys. This is the density parameter plan. There are three density zones on the residential site, 30 to 40 dwellings per hectare, closest to the countryside along the edge, 40 to 50 near the employment land and by the school, and then a 50 to 60 dwelling per hectare zone by the local centre and along this east-west road, which you can see in the darker colour. The density parameter plan also allows for residential development within the local centre at a density of 50 to 60 dwellings per hectare. This is the access parameter plan. Um, access was also a reserve matter, and it shows the principle of two accesses into the residential site in the location of the current access to the farm and one slightly further east. It shows three pedestrian and cycle crossings across a little more road. These are fairly faint on this plan, but I'll, I'll just try and point them out as best I can. Uh, one in this location um, in the residential area, one further along and one further along closer to the employment area. So they are three um, crossings with, which were indicated on the parameter plans serving the residential site, local centre and employment. The section 106 of the outline permission ties down that a minimum of three crossings must be provided and requires that details of any crossings are provided and secured before the homes are occupied. This is a landscape and ecology plan it shows the locations of the retained hedgerows, trees and ponds across the site and the suds. Within the residential area, you've got two north-south linear open spaces, a buffer to the open countryside and another north-south open space along this edge as well. You can see there are a number of trees shown on this plan. Uh, most streets are shown to have trees, uh, particularly the east-west road and this northern north-south axis. This is an illustrative master plan. This was um, approved at the outline stage and it simply combines the um, approved parameters and shows one way in which they could be combined to uh, produce an acceptable scheme. And the condition, one of the conditions on the outline scheme was that 
the reserve matters need to be informed by this master plan. And you can see a number of the features interpreted with the residential site, the suds, and the buffers along the northern edge. So that's the parameter plans. Just turning to the public benefits, a number were established at the outline stage and have been carried through to this reserve matters application. Um, they include 35% affordable housing, split 50-50 between affordable rented and intermediate. That was tied down as part of the section 106 and the reserve matters meets that, meets that tenure split. The outline required a number of open spaces and play spaces to be provided. You've got one NEEP, a neighborhood equipped area of play and a school site. Some of the objections to the to the proposal are focused on the lack of community infrastructure. This table shows that a number of those, those infrastructure requirements were tied down at the outline stage. So there's contributions here towards education, just over 6,000 pounds per eligible unit, community facilities, around 300,000, swimming pool contribution, libraries, sports center, contribution towards the Lod Lodmore Nature Reserve. There's children's play and open space and a primary health care contribution. So th yeah, there's also benefits down here for new homes bonus and um, SIL, the, the, the scheme was not SIL rated, so I'm just, I'm just pointing that out on this slide. So since outline planning permission was granted in 2020, a design code phasing plan, landscape and, and ecology management plan have been approved under discharge conditions. They essentially add a further layer of detail which shape the reserve matters. I'm just going to touch on these briefly as we go through. So the, just turning to the design code, this sets a number of rules which must, should, and could be followed at the reserved matters stage. On the left-hand side, you can see the parameter plan, which I've just gone through, the land use parameter plan. And on the right, you can see an extract from the design code, which made ma minor adjustments to the, um, to the parameter plan as allowed by the, by the conditions. And just to point out some of these key changes, um, what you see here is a large area of open space by Littlemore Road. This is to accommodate a suds pond, a permanent landscape feature at this entrance to the site. The NEEP, the play space, was originally shown within the center of this residential area. What the design code has done is um, change that location slightly to the northern part of this open space and consequently move some of the residential development around to fill back where that um, play space was. And I think that, that provides a better relationship with the school site and the surrounding open space. You can also see there's a reduction in some of the roads which, which cross the site. The outline parameter plan showed them crossing here and they've been reduced to just the east-west road. There have also been minor changes along the northern part of the site where there was a pinch point. I think it was down to something like 10 metres in, in this corner, and that has been amended slightly through the design code. So that's the design code. This is the approved phasing plan. Again, this was part of the discharge of conditions, and it shows three phases, four phases of residential development. Phase one is in orange here by the western entrance. The second phase is by the school in purple third phase in light blue, and the fourth phase in dark blue. Um, critical to the phasing is the landscaping and the strategic landscaping given the AOMB setting. Um, that landscaping is shown on the outside in dark, in dark um, green and along the west side, and that is required to come forward at, a, at an early stage following the discharge conditions and approval of reserved matters. Um, the timescales for the delivery of the housing are subject to the discharge conditions, <coughs> and the applicant advises that construction is targeted to start next year, early next year, with an eight-year build period. Um, it's expected that phases one and two will be developed slightly quicker with um, over, five, over 50 homes per year. So we could see the first homes in 2024. This is the Landscape and Ecology Management Plan, also approved under discharge conditions. And just to point out that this sets the um, habitat areas, new areas of habitat creation, native woodland, um, nature reserve to the north of the site, and things like bat bird boxes. That was um, developed in consultation with the council's natural environment team. So now turning to this reserve matters application, which we're looking at today, I've gone through the parameter plans and the key docs as approved as part of the discharge conditions. These all inform 
the reserve matters application which we've got. So to be clear, this application is for the detailed design that, that comes through the reserve matters, namely access, layout, scale, appearance, and landscaping. So I'm just going to take each of those in turn. Um, and firstly, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just cover the, the master plan as well. So the, this is the master plan for the reserve matter site. And you can see it takes a lot of the features that I've just gone through on the parameter plans. You can see here the residential area broadly aligns with the parameter plans. You have the open spaces um, north-south in these locations. You have the woodland buffer. The play space is located at the north of this open space. And you have two accesses from Littlemore Road. Outside of the site, this, this isn't part of the reserve matters, but it's just shown for illustrative purposes, the school site, the employment area, and the local centre. So this is the housing mix of the reserve mat scheme. There is, the outline allows for up to 500 homes. The reserve matters proposes 500 homes. They are split across 15 different house types, ranging from one bed apartments up to four bedroom houses. The affordable housing mix is 35%, and that is split 50-50 between affordable rented and shared ownership in line with the section 106 agreement. The affordable housing is front loaded. So phases one and two include most of the affordable housing. Um, phase one delivers 58% of the affordable housing and phase two delivers 30%. So together that is front loaded within the early phases of development. In terms of sustainability, um, we have the building regulations, the new building regulations, which came into force this year in June. They set out transitional arrangements whereby if an initial building notice is submitted before mid-June, then schemes could follow the old regulations. That's as long as the homes are started uh, before mid-June next year. So an initial notice was submitted um, before that date. So it's expected that the homes will comply um, with the old builder regulations as a minimum. And because this is an eight year build period, um, a number of the homes are likely to, to follow the new building regulations as well. For renewable and low carbon energy, the energy, energy statement submitted recommends use of solar thermal and PV panels and potential for air source heat pumps in the future. The requirement for renewable energy was not conditioned at the outline stage and it cannot be mandated now. That will be a matter for the developer as they, as they take forward the reserve matters. In terms of electrical vehicle charging, there was a condition on the outline scheme and details have been approved. What, um, what the electrical vehicle charging shows is um, the majority of on-plot parking spaces include electrical vehicle charging facilities. So the key planning issues of, of this application, I've gone through the principle of development, that's informed by the, um, the parameter plans, the, the key documents, the, the LEMP, the design code. So I won't, I won't um, cover that any further, but I'll just touch on the um, key the key reserve matters here, access, layout, scale, appearance, and landscaping. And I'll, I'll just take each of those in turn. So access. Access, as I mentioned, there are two accesses, a Western access, and which is a primary access, and an Eastern secondary access. The Western access aligns with the current access to the farm in the center of the site. And a cycle route is proposed along this Eastern boundary. Um, your note from the the earlier photos that there is a cycle pedestrian route along this, along this northern side. Um, that will be interrupted by, by the entrance and that's always been expected by the, um, by the, outline, the outline approval and the allocation. Um, the proposals for these entrances would include a new right-hand turn lane into um, both entrances. And you can see here there is a crossing proposed to the west of um, the primary entrance. So that's closer to the local center. And the form really takes, um, it's, it's the same as the existing crossings across Littlemore Road. Um, that, the detail of that is subject to separate highways approval outside of this reserve mass application. Um, you see from the report that the highway, highways authority has no objection subject to a phasing condition. Um, that condition requires that the Western access is delivered before any homes in in phases one and two are occupied, and the eastern access is provided before any, any homes in phases three and four are occupied. This markup 
show some of the key routes across the site. Um, there is a bus route. Again, this was a requirement of the Section 106 for the um, outline scheme. There is the cycle route, which comes from Littlemore Road um, up the central open space to the school site. And there are a network of pedestrian routes across the site. This, this markup just shows a few of them, but you can see that it links up all of the open spaces from the southeast corner to the central open space, the western open space, and then further north where you've got that, um, that open space area. And overall access is considered to be acceptable. Layout. Here you can see the urban character area in blue and the rural character area in red. These character areas were defined as part of the design code and there are a total of 15 different house types spread across the development from apartments up to four bed houses. This plan just shows some of the key areas of the site to show how the layout works. And you can see on the left here, near where the current local center is and the expected local center to the west, you've got apartment blocks here on the corner and on the um, corner of this east-west road. Again, that aligns with the design code, which propose that they'd be in um, key corner sites, key corner areas of the site. There's a high proportion of terraces in this area, as you would expect, it's the area of highest density. It's closest to the local center and the school. And the house west of the entrance here faces outwards. So the, the doors face towards the road to provide that gateway along with the open space. Next to the school, which is up here, and the open space, the homes are spaced slightly more. You've got more detached and semi-detached properties. There are more, there's a more regular rhythm of houses along this open space, and it creates a strong sense of place. Along the northeast boundary, you can see, again, the density reduces. You have slightly larger plots with some bungalows along this edge. And whereas the little more allocation states that no home should be provided, above the 40 meter contour, the approved design codes sets out a flexible approach for some buildings along that boundary, as long as they are bungalows. So all phases do include affordable housing. It's front loaded within phases one and two. The section 106 approved as a part of the outline says that affordable housing should be distributed in no more than clusters of 15 homes. There are some areas of the site where there are slightly larger areas um, of affordable housing, but the roads are the roads are mixed. They include a mix of affordable and market homes, and I think overall that provides a mixed and balanced community across the development. The layout of the open spaces and community infrastructure. There are four main areas across the site: the strategic landscape area to the north up here, the neap at this northern part of the site, the woodland buffers, and the linear open spaces. This is just a close-up of the NEEP. Um, it was um, tied down as part of the outline that there'd be a minimum 400 square meter NEEP. The location is, has been changed um, slightly. So you can see here it's now um, next to the school site. Um, at the end of this northern open space, this provides a, a better relationship with the open space and um, play on the way for people traveling to school. The area exceeds the minimum in the, in the outline and the layout has been negotiated over the course of the, um, the application. It's a convenient location. The mugger has been proposed in an area furthest away. That's where you're more likely to get your kind of loud ball games further away from, from the homes. And there's a fence shown around here for, um, yeah, to enclose, the, to enclose the, the play area. There's also space here for social spaces and it, it generally provides space for play for all ages and abilities, including um, less abled. This slide shows the three open spaces, um, the western, central, eastern spaces. It aligns with the, the layout in the outline, outline approval and the parameter plans. All spaces include pedestrian routes. The central includes that dedicated cycle route um, along the west side. The, the spaces include suds, which are subject to um, discharge conditions on the outline. And the eastern space allows potential to connect into land outside the application boundary as required by the, um, by the outline approval. 
this just shows the details, the outline details of the SUDs. These are subject to separate approval under discharging conditions, but as you can see here, the intention is for stepped SUDs with shallow, with shallow gradients. Um, the, the southern pond here is expected to be a, a permanent water feature, and the others have the capacity to, um, to have water um, in the events of surface water um, need. Fencing's not proposed at this stage um, around these suds, but that's something that's conditioned and would need to come forward as part of the discharge conditions. This is a strategic landscape area to the north. Um, this has been conceived as a nature reserve and parkland in line, with, in line with the LEMP, so there's a public open space in the center and strategic woodland buffer to the um, outside. It will provide walking routes to the play area and the rest of the site. There are six areas of woodland across the site. Um, along, the, along the boundaries here, you've also got um, retained hedgerows along some of these, um, some of these open spaces. And you can see the layout's been designed to retain most of those hedgerows. Um, on the right-hand side here, um, you can see that, um, yeah, some of that retention. And you've also got street trees. There was a comment in the, um, from the landscape officer covered in the report. Um, the landscape officer um, feels that the woodland should have a depth of 30 meters. Um, what, what we've got here is, is below 30 meters, but that aligns with the, um, the outline approval and the, and the landscape environmental management plan. The 30 meter depth has not been mandated. So just the layout, touch on the layout of the roads and the footpaths. As I've mentioned, they've been designed to accommodate buses. Um, through this route up to the school. The roads have been minimized on the periphery of the site, and that's in response to comments from Dorset AOMB and the street lighting team to um, reduce light spill and try and provide dark skies. There's a central cycle route here, which has got Copenhagen-style crossing, which essentially gives priority to, to cycles across that junction. And the roads have been appropriately designed and tracked for refuse vehicles and emergency vehicles. The, the roads have been amended over the course of the application. There's been meetings with the Highways Authority, and they've been designed to have a design speed of 20 miles an hour. So that is a lower speed within the site, and that's been achieved through build-outs within, within the roads, so there aren't those long areas of straight roads where cars can build up speed. And overall, the, the layout accords with the reserve matters and the principles of the, out, of the parameter plans and design code. Turn into scale. This plan shows the heights of buildings across the site. You can see the single story buildings in yellow, um, mostly on the periphery. And then you've also got um, garages within the main part of the site, two story buildings in orange, and then the four apartment blocks here, here, and here. And they, they align with the parameter plans, um, which show potential for three story buildings, some three story buildings along this east-west east road. Um, along the periphery, the design code did amend the um, did amend the, the heights of buildings. So the, the outline parameter plan showed that you could have two story buildings across the entirety of the site. The the design code amended that to require um, bungalows um, or say that bungalows should be provided um, along this boundary and must be provided above the 40 meter contour. We have the reserve matters show that all buildings above the 40 meter contour are single story. Um, but there are instances of, as you can see on the right-hand side here, um, you have got some two-story buildings along this boundary. Um, importantly, they are below the 40-metre contour, and there's, there's only a couple of instances here and here. So overall, the scale of the proposals are considered to be acceptable. And you can just, I'm just pointing out the, um, some of these sections here. You can see um, this section along here with the majority of the buildings being two-story, and then you've got the three-story apartment block. Again, here you've got the um, apartment block nestled within the center of the site. In terms of the in individual scale of the buildings, there are the 15 house types, and as set out in the committee report and update sheet, nationally described space standards are not mandated, and they, they can't be required at this reserve matter stage. But we've, we've looked at the um, space standards as, as an indicator of the design quality and the scale, and what this shows is that um, 
the size of the dwellings range from 90%, so that's you know 10% below space standards, up to 122%, so slightly above space standards. Overall, there is a shortfall against the space standards at 65% for below nationally dis dis described space standards. Some fall slightly below, others are up to 10%. So whilst a slightly higher proportion of affordable homes fall short of the standard, um, all dwellings provide what's considered to be an acceptable level of amenity for the day-to-day -day living conditions. And here you can see just a comparison of house type D, which is one of the, um, one of the market houses with the affordable, one of the affordable houses, they have suitable levels of internal amenity. And overall, the, the scale is considered to be acceptable. Appearance. As noted earlier, we, we have two character areas and there are different approaches to appearance within those character areas. So within the urban character areas, materials include a soft palette of, of materials, coloured render, grey, buff, multi-stop brick. You've got concrete terracotta tiles and concrete slate effect roof tiles. Within this western part of the character area, so this is by the school site um, and the local centre, houses have a more um, uniform roof height with the majority of houses being provided as terraces and semi-detached houses. Here you can see some of the examples of the house types within this part of the site. And the design features include modern projecting bay windows, arched doorways, chimneys on key feature plots. The appearance is distinctly urban and appropriate for this part of the site, which is closest to the, to the proposed new local centre and the employment area. And this just shows an artist's impression of, um, of the Western, looking from that Western open space here, you can see some of the buildings front onto this open space, um, providing natural surveillance and enhancing that character. Another part of the urban character area, the gateway to the site. Here, buildings on the building on the corner, um, this building here has been orientated to front Littlemore Road to, to enhance that entrance. Apartments are located at key junctions. So that's a, just an extract of one of the apartment elevations. And you can see here, that is the boundary of the, the east-west road. So that, that height and location of those, those buildings, the materiality, it draws on the materials of the houses. And that helps with wayfinding and placemaking being in the, in the center of the site. This artist's impression is taken from Littlemore Road. It shows that um, front-on building here uh, facing the street and the gateway. You can also see the, um, the cycle route. Um, just to point out on the appearance that there is a varied palette of materials and roofscapes which, which creates visual interest in this location. The final area I'm just going to mention on the um, urban character area is the main east-west route. Um, here you have a uh, more regular pattern and rhythm of houses. They are mostly semi-detached properties. They are spaced slightly further apart with garages to the side. Detailing includes a high proportion of buildings with arched, arched doorways, and the approach creates that strong sense of place along with street trees on the north side of the road. So again, this is an artist's impression of the East West Road. Um, it is a slightly dated um, visual, there are only trees on the, on the north side of the road, as, as I've mentioned. But you can see here, it creates that strong character with the varied appearance, materials, the location of the pair of semi-detached properties at the end of, end of this route uh, really terminates that view. And you can just see the, um, the, the three-story apartment block on this corner. Within the rural character area, it's based, the appearance is based on the contemporary interpretation of a village. It provides a more organic and informal layout there's a higher proportion here of detached properties, and you also have bungalows along that uh, northern countryside edge, along with some two-storey buildings. The materials include, um, include wood, um, wood and stone, and you have a different in materials here on the lower portions and upper portions of the building. And there's, there's detailing with the chimneys on key plots bold window frames um, and arched doorways. It, it takes inspiration from, um, well, the whole, the, whole, the whole appearance of the development takes inspiration from other parts of, of Weymouth surrounding villages, as noted by the, um, 
the urban design officer in the report. And overall, the appearance is considered appropriate and in line with the design code. The final reserve matter, landscaping, I'll just touch on this briefly because I've covered it in some of the other sections, but just to reiterate, the, the northern area here, that does form part of the reserve matter site. Um, that is a strategic landscape area with public open space and woodland along the, the boundary. It creates a natural habitat. The north-south open space, um, they, they provide suds, as I've mentioned, and will be landscaped with trees and wildflower planting. In terms of the streets, there are key routes throughout the site. Um, as, as I've shown on, that, um, on the earlier plans, you've got, a, you've got a strong rhythm of street trees here across the, the northern part of that, that east-west road. That aligns with the, um, the landscaping parameter plan. And this road here has trees on both sides of the road. Um, in the officer's report, it goes through the comments from um, the landscape officer, who notes that there is an absence of um, tree-lined streets across um, across the development the MPPF requires that streets are tree lined I think this what what we have here strikes a, a good balance between providing street trees on key parts of the site and a lot of work has gone into balancing the need for street trees along with servicing car parking um, particularly visitor parking across the site so we have street trees on, on, I think, the important parts of the, the important streets of the site, and other streets do include trees, but they are um, not as regularly spaced. So the recommendation um, overall is to approve the reserve matter subject to conditions. This recommendation takes into account the minor conflicts with policy with the lack of the um, tree on streets on all, all streets and some homes being above the 40 metre contour line. The conditions, these conditions are additional to the outline permission. We have the approved drawings, the external materials, which is additional. Um, there wasn't external material conditions on the, on the outline, but we feel there's a need for extra detail now. There's a condition on substations and other details. There's obscure glazing on some of the plots to make sure that um, overlooking is um, avoided. There's details on facade specification, tackling noise as required by the um, the um, environmental statement for the outline. There are, is a boundary treatments condition for masonry walls along the, the key parts of the site and along Littlemore Road. Um, there's a place base condition for some of the finer details to come out as discharge conditions, conditional finished floor levels, the access for the junctions, as I mentioned, the highways authority need that to be phased um, for the western and eastern entrance. And there is the external lighting to be provided in line with the, the lighting details. Um, and finally, the removal of permit development rights for roof extensions for those, those buildings which are higher than 38 metres on that contour. Um, so that will give the council further control over alterations to that sensitive part of the site. That concludes my presentation, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Matthew. Before we go to public speakers, can I confirm with the committee that they've received the update sheet which was distributed yesterday? <coughs> All present and correct. Yep. Could I also remember Council Ireland? Welcome, Council Ireland. Can I remind you that in fact, because you missed the first part of the presentation, you won't be able to participate in the debate or vote. I understand, Chairman. Um, I have to point out that my calendar invite is still showing 10 o'clock. So, you know, I turned up on time as far as I was concerned. OK. OK, we're going to now go on to the speakers, and I now uh, invite Councillor Graham Brandt, who's a member of Bingham uh, Parish Council, to address the committee. Uh, Councillor Brandt, uh, please speak directly into the microphone. You have three minutes. Over to you. He's not. Okay, and Councillor, and uh, Mr. Steve Taylor isn't here either, is he? He was another speaker. Mm -hmm. okay. I now invite uh, uh, Brett Spiller, the agent uh, for the applicant, to address the committee. Uh, please speak directly into the microphone. And again, you have three minutes. 
Over to you, uh, Mr. Spear. Lovell Homes, an experienced national house builder, Abbury, an affordable housing provider and strategic partner to Homes England, and the landowners who have worked collaboratively with Dorset Council for many years. In advance of today's committee, I sent you a summary explaining the evolution of the scheme. The application follows the allocation of the Littlemore Urban Extension in the local plan, an outline consent for mixed use development, together with a legal agreement to secure timely delivery of physical and social infrastructure as well as the approval of a design framework, phasing plan and a landscape and ecological management plan, which provides an added tier of detail. Each stage was subject to consultation and scrutiny. This application contains details of the access, layout, scale, appearance and landscaping for the first phase of the development, namely the construction of 500 new homes. The committee report explains the two proposed character areas and alludes to the variation in grain, rhythm, spacing and materials. As acknowledged in the report, the perimeter blocks, design features, material and materials reflect the wider character of Weymouth, Binkham and Lawton Park. The proposal before you will deliver beautiful homes and spaces, ensuring a high quality living environment for future residents and visitors. Multifunctional green spaces permeate the development, providing a feeling of spaciousness and they will afford future occupiers access to open space, promoting health and well-being. As you've heard, a neighbourhood play space, including a mugger, forms an integral part of the scheme. We've worked closely with your officers to reconcile competing objectives and improve the scheme, not least in terms of the integration of roads, street lighting and tree planting. The approach ensures that routes are safe, convenient and attractive for all users. Street trees have been supplemented by those within the open spaces and private gardens, as well as over 23,000 trees along the outer edges and the applicant has already committed to plant up the woodland edges following the approval of reserved matters, meaning that they will mature during the course of the eight-year build programme. The scheme is biased towards family homes, uh, and as you've heard, 175 of the new homes will be affordable, with a high percentage delivered in the early phases, within close proximity to the school, local centre and play space. Over 10,500 households were waiting for a council house in Dorset as of March last year, so front-loading will give a much-needed boost to the stock of modern, energy-efficient homes. An inevitable consequence of front-loading is a more condensed distribution, uh, but that said, the affordable homes will be indistinguishable in appearance from the market dwellings, and there is a healthy mix of tenures, including affordable rent and shared ownership. Abbey will assume management responsibility and are entirely comfortable with this arrangement. The applicants commend the officer's report to you and respectfully request that you approve the application subject to the conditions listed in section 17 of the report. Thank you, Chairman. I also invite Councillor Ronald Tarr, Ward Member for Winterbourne and Broadmain, to address the committee. Again, you have three minutes. Over to you. Um, I would like to thank the staff who've been working on this, uh, both for the developer and for the council first class work um, recently, and the consultation has been good. Um, the um, scheme was a bit shoddy to start with, it was on the back of an envelope type design, and it's been massively upgraded. Um, and I, I do that amazing contribution by, by Matthew there, half an hour to, to do all that work, enormous amount of work over the last few months. Uh, I really want to appreciate that and the work from the housing people. However, <laughs> I do wish to say that as a person who's been dealing with protected areas in Dorset for nearly half a century, this place, this whole development is in the wrong place, the wrong time. I have not got a single person in my ward who supported it. If you go up onto the ridge, that's where Hardy took Roger Kipling to show him what a beautiful county you lived in. It's a World Heritage Site view. It, it, you see the whole of the heritage site virtually from White Nose through right round from that point. It's in the same line as the Pyramids of Giza and the Grand Canyon. That's what we're talking about. And I'm really sh still shocked and I think it's a very sad day. I know that you have to approve it, but I'm very disappointed. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Councillor Tara. I now invite uh, Councillor Louis O'Leary, Ward Member for a little more in Preston, to address the committee. You also have three minutes, uh, Councillor Louis. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, 
Um, nobody loves a lost cause more than I do. However, on this development, um, I accept that the decision has been made to go forward with this plan. Um, and I accept the approval of the principle of approval for this development. But as a lifelong Littlemore resident and as a representative of Littlemore, um, I'm just going to ask for some changes and put forward some amendments. Number one, and these are all designed to lessen the negative effects of this development on the community of Littlemore and the surrounding area, including Preston, Broadway, and Binkham. Number one, a roundabout at the ends of major junctions along Littlemore Road. This will help reduce the growing congestion that many of us are aware of in this area. Second is to proper crossings along Littlemore Road to ensure that we have a safe uh, road for people to cross from one area to another, especially when there's going to be schools on both sides. Number three is to relook at the allocation of the Section 106 money that forms part of this development to ensure it goes to the right places and goes to where it's needed. Then we have a reduction of speed along Littlemore Road from 40 miles per hour down to 30 miles per hour. It's unacceptable that most of Littlemore Road is 30. We're going to keep it at 40 despite the fact that one side is now going to have 500 houses on the other side. At the 2019 uh, meeting of this planning committee where we agreed the outline plan and permission, I was the only member to vote against. I stick by that. Um, I understand why it was passed. But I did speak at that meeting about the feeling from Littlemore that we are left behind and we are being ignored. Littlemore is the third most deprived community in Dorset, behind only Portland, and the Underhill Ward on Portland and the town centre in Weymouth. It is a historic area and the community has a certain identity that I'm afraid a number of other places would be envious of. And what I'm asking for us to do as a committee, or what you to do as a committee, is to please show it that we are listening and we would take these concerns on board and accept them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leary. I call on Matthew Pokenhawks to respond with any salient points he may wish to clarify. Thank you. I'll just um, take the comments from um, Roland Tarr um, first. The, as, as, as Councillor Tarr will acknowledge, the, there is a long-standing allocation on this site. It is, the local plan acknowledges is, that it is a very sensitive site in terms of the AONB setting. Um, that has been considered at all stages of the planning process in the allocation of the site. In the outline, there was the assessment of the impact on the AOMB, and there were the um, parameter plans which tied down the heights and the landscaping, um, important mitigating features on this um, sensitive site. And now at the reserve matters stage, you can see how those features have come through um, to, to show themselves in the, in, the, in the reserve matters with the um, landscaping along the edge of the site, the building heights, and that sensitive really relates to the um, to the, set, the setting of the site within AONB. Um, turning to Councillor O'Leary's comments um, on the, the principal development, a, a number of these points were um, highway matters, so I defer to um, my colleague Steve Savage to come in on some of those, those responses. But um, here, generally here we have the um, reserve matters application um, for access and the other reserve matters. Um, the question of whether um, roundabout should be provided along Littlemore Road, that falls outside of the scope of this um, reserve matters application and is not considered um, necessary. The speed limit, I'm conscious of comments um, that have been raised about the speed limit along Littlemore Road being reduced from 40 to 30 miles an hour. That is covered in the um, officer's report and the Highways Authority has no safety concerns about, about that. Linked to the linked to the um, speed limit and crossings is, is, is the requirement for three crossings to be provided by the outline. That is fundamental to the outline approval and what we've got here is one crossing provided on the, on the western side. The detailed design will come out of the highways process, the section 278 approvals that will um, be scrutinised by the highways team and, and approved um, and that will ensure proper crossings are provided. And I think there was a question about the, the Section 106 reallocation of funds as well. 
this this is a reserve matters application. It doesn't reopen those those funding requirements. They are they are set within the outline application and with the um, Section 106 agreement that was provided pro provided as part of that. And there is a, is quite a broad list of um, financial contributions that that need to be made, as well as the on site. Um, on-site provision that needs to be provided there as well in terms of the play space and the open spaces. Thank you. Are any points to be raised by highways or any relevant council officers? <coughs> Over to uh, uh, Mr. Savage. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members, members of the public. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Councillor Lee for raising those um, three particular points. I think they're very relevant to the consideration of this site. I think the important thing with regards to um, the consideration of this application is that the outline established the principle of the development. And as a consequence, the impact on the traffic network, the local and strategic highway network, was considered at that time. So the impacts of the traffic on the various junctions was looked at. The, um, the growth of the traffic and the projected traffic figures from this new development were considered. And the outcome of that was that as a highway authority, we were accepting of it based on the network as it currently exists. So whilst I can appreciate why Councillor O'Leary may suggest that we need other improvements, we can't actually ask for any further improvements because we accepted it at the time as an authority. With regards to the crossings, I, I think, um, Matthew's um, explanation is very concise. Uh, three crossing points have been identified as being required um, for the development as a whole, the holistic approach, if you like. This application provides one just to the west of the new Western Junction, which is not signalised. It's a uh, pedestrian crossing with an island, which pretty much echoes all the other crossing points we have along Lismore Road at the moment. Uh, this crossing itself will be subject to the associated Section 278 works, which will look at the junction, the new Western Junction. Uh, what I would say in response to Councillor O'Leary's um, query here is that obviously we've got more phases to come. We've got another two junctions to come. And if it's identified that some form of controlled crossing is necessary, then we will obviously wholly consider it at that time. Uh, the current application for the 500 dwellings, we didn't feel that it was appropriate or necessary, which is why we have before us a simple crossing with a um, pedestrian island. The, the thorny issue of the speed limit reduction, reduction, I mean, I wasn't privy to being involved in the outline application, um, but there's nothing mentioned in that that says that we require the speed limit, the necessary traffic regulation order for a speed limit reduction to be pursued as um, part of the resultant reserve matters application. So we are where we are at the moment. We can't ask for it. We have no justification to ask for that to be provided. But again, if it's proven with the later phases that we have a higher level of projected traffic growth as such, then again, we can reinvestigate that. The only other way of looking at this is that the, um, the local town council would have to pursue this through the normal channels with the authority to see if it's an appropriate um, mechanism that needs to be employed here. So we can't, we've got no justification for that. We've got no justification for any further offsite highway works. And we've got no justification, as I see it, for the pedestrian uh, crossing that's being provided to be upgraded to a signalised crossing at all. So hopefully I've addressed the questions there, Chair, but obviously happy to, um, to provide further clarification if necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Savage. Right, committee, are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer or highways? <clears throat> Councillor Cuggy. To remember how to put it on properly. Um, it's to do with, on page 51, it says about um, uh, uh, the va vast majority of apartments are dual aspect. Um, I don't know whether this applies to this or whether this is relevant. When we went on a site visit and we looked at the betterment um, Curtis Fields home, one of the f two of the fogs, the flats over garages, only had windows one side. And when we was walking around the site, it looked really peculiar because it would just look like one big brick wall. And it had windows only facing one way. So I just wanted to make sure that all the flats and the apartments and bogs on that site have 
windows <coughs> both sides because to me it wasn't a very the amenity of the flat only having sunlight coming out through one window wasn't really very a good amenity for the occupant so I just wanted to make sure that the flats and the, the apartments and the fogs had windows mm. on both sides because this wall just looked not a very attractive but also not very nice amenity for the occupants so that was my question Thank you, uh, Councillor Cocking. I'm going to hand that back to, to Matthew to respond, please. Thank you. Um, I wasn't on the, the, the site visit, but in terms of the, um, the amount that are dual aspect, it's 80% um, of the apartments are dual aspect. So they have windows on more than one side of the building. So around 20% are single aspect. And that's um, in some, some instances, you have the shape of the block, the apartment block, which is L shaped. Um, so they have windows um, looking out to one side and don't have windows on the other side. I think overall it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good level of compliance for uh, a flatted scheme. 80% is, uh, is fairly good um, compliance overall. Uh, do we have any other technical questions for the case officer or, or highways? Councillor Bowell. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of questions, I think, uh, stemming from Councillor O'Leary's uh, comments. Um, Section 106 can be rene renegotiated, providing both parties agree. I believe that's the case, or have I got that wrong? Oh, sorry, Chair. That was a comment for the planning officer. Question. Yeah, it's maybe a, a, a question for, for legal, um, but in, um, in amending a, um, an outline approval, which we haven't got, we've got this, we've got this reserve matters application in front of us. Um, but as, as a met, if you were amending an outline proposal, um, you could um, make changes to a section 106 agreement through a, through a deed of variation. And that, that some, sometimes happens on, on large mixed use schemes. So it is, it is possible. I'll pass to Phil if he's got anything further to, to add. At your suggestion, I'm going to hand that back to legal or to our, our, our lawyer. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Ma Matthew's ab absolutely right. Um, but the, the scheme of delegation sets out certain parameters where um, amendments to Section 106 obligations can be made under officer delegated powers and, and where those need to be referred back to committee. Does that answer your question, Councillor Bowell? Um, not clearly, Chair. Um, we, this is a result of the, the Verse Farm uh, development that's going on in Bridport, where this, uh, this has become a bone of contention about the Section 106 um, it was stated categorically that this was done at outline stage and there was no chance of doing anything, anything about it. Now, I've, I've looked into it subsequently and I've, uh, I understand, as I said just now, that under a deed of variation, the section 106 can be changed, even if it was uh, set in concrete, so-called, at, uh, at the outline stage. So I just want to um, follow up on what Councillor O'Leary said because it was dismissed just now as it couldn't, nothing could be done on that. I don't see that that's the case. Um, I also want to... Uh, bring up the fact that um, LITT1, subsection 5, requires that the site is developed in accordance with a master plan and lists a set of principles that the development should adhere to. And then underneath it says, a master plan has not been prepared. So I'm rather confused as to why a, a policy that's um, that big um, has, has been ignored and there's a, just a sort of approximation been submitted. Um, and I'd also like to point out that I live just off the A35 in Bridport, which is a 40 mile per hour speed limit with an island crossing. And um, people wait five, 10 minutes in the morning trying to cross that road with children, wheelchairs, motability scooters. And I just feel it's a shame that I'm, trying, I'm campaigning now for, for a lit crossing. I think it's a shame that this opportunity is being missed not to put something in that ensures safety of pedestrians rather than having a guess at whether the gap is big enough and running like hell for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bowell. I think there's about three questions in there. Now, the first one I'm going to hand back to our lawyer, Phil, to, to reply, and then I'm going to come back to, uh, to the case officer. So over to you. 
Thank you, Chair. So, yes, technically, and, and uh, Section 106 obligation is a, an agreement between the various parties. Like any agreement, it can be varied by agreement or under specifically because of Section 106, it can be um, an application can be made to vary in certain circumstances. Um, but it has to be agreed. So that, that there then have to be good reasons for those variations to be made in planning terms. It's the short answer. It's, it's not simply a case of um, developer asks and gets or the planning authority asks and gets. Thank you, Phil. Now I'm going to go back to case officer, uh, Matt, in order to cover points two and three. Thank you, Chair. The second question was about the, um, the master plan and the lit one allocation within the local plan. So that, that's from our 2015 local plan. It, it says that the site should be developed in accordance with a master plan prepared by the developer landowner in conjunction with the local community. Um, at the time of the local plan, um, there wasn't a master plan. That was 2015. Um, in 2020, when the outline was approved, um, there was a master plan. There was the illustrative master plan that was informed by the parameter plans as part of that outline scheme. Um, that's where the, the master plan came in. And again, at this um, third reserve matter stage, there is a further master plan, the detailed master plan um, that, that I showed, um, and the design code that kind of sits behind that and sets some of these uh, requirements. So that has been, has been produced since the local plan was adopted. The, um, the final question was um, about the, the crossing points and the pedestrian waiting times um, ac across that road. And I think you've heard from um, Steve, Steve Savage about the, the, um, the current crossing, un unsignalized crossing, being appropriate at, at this stage for the 500 residential units. Um, I, I don't know if, if Steve has anything further to, to add to that response. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Councillor Bohr? Um, almost, Chair. Um, I'm still concerned about this, uh, this, this crossing business that I'm in a position to have to, um, you know, to get a petition up to get the speed limit dropped to 30 miles per hour, which has been looked at by our MP as well, and also a lit crossing for pedestrian safety. Even the highway code now says that in the hierarchy, the pedestrians are key and their safety is key. And we're missing an opportunity to put a light crossing in now. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Thank you. Okay, right. Are there any other questions of a technical nature for the case officer or highways? Uh, Councillor Don C for Chairman. Yeah, you've got in there first. <clears throat> I am. Um... I just wondered, with a brand new development, why there were short, some shortfalls in space standards of scale, in that some of these, the, some of the flats and houses would appear to be several degrees less than is recommended. Could you, could you say something about that, please? Thank you, uh, Councillor Dempsey. Can I, can you reply to that, please, sir? Yes, thank you, Councillor. That that's set out in um, in some detail in the um, report. Those those standards are optional space standards set out in the um, the MPPF. Um, they are um, encouraged within our within our local plan, but they are um, not mandated. I think what we've what we've got here, we've got um, shortfalls of up to ten percent against those space standards. Um, some are slightly below. Some are. Are down to ten percent below, and others are are larger than that, and that that comes out of the you know the the detailed design of um, of the proposals and the you know the, the layout of the site. So we we'd always encourage as as officers um, compliance, but that can't be can't be required, can't be mandated within um, within the scheme. It wasn't a, a requirement of the design code um, or of the outline. Um, so I think over, overall, it, the, there's no homes that fall below um, below 90 percent. Thank you, 
Thank you, Pathy. Does that answer your question, uh, Councillor Dunsey? Thank you. Do we have any other technical questions for the case officer or highways? Would appear not, Chairman. Mr. Savage, would you like to make any further points in, in reply to those questions? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just in response to Councillor Bolwell, the, the crossing point scenario, the um, uh, Probably most councillors have encountered our um, legendary PV squared calculation, which is an empirical calculation that looks at gaps in traffic, the composition of traffic, the time it takes to cross roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we would look at this uh, that that particular calculation if we were upgrading an, an existing crossing. Uh, the existing crossings um, function, we're going to get more pedestrian traffic through. We're of the opinion that the what's proposed immediately to the west of the junction is satisfactory. And as I alluded to before, if um, when further phases come through, we have the opportunity to provide a further two crossing points. This is something that we can obviously further consider then, having looked at the additional impact of traffic on the network, the prevailing traffic speeds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's something that we can um, we can, as I say, further look at at that time. But we are we it was never identified at the outline stage that we required signalised crossings. It may be difficult to provide a signalised crossing where the applicant has put an unsignalised crossing at the moment. So there's lots of factors that come into play, but I think it really comes down to that justification. We couldn't ask for it at the outline stage. We have been able to unable to ask for it as a on the basis of the 500 dwellings before us. But let's not rule it out. Let's um, let's be certain that when we we come for the other phases that if it's required then we'll be looking for it um other than that chair i think matthew's covered everything with regards to the internal layout i think it's important to bear in mind that it's going to be traffic speed to no more than 20 miles per hour by virtue of on-site on-street calming uh, by design we've got full refuse collection phase plan submitted we've got the bus route provided to the school um we've looked um, coherently at the parking we've looked coherently at the street lighting and tried to minimize impacts on trees so uh, the charity i can give members is that the road layout you see in front of you is satisfactory it meets with our adoptive criteria so if it's offered to us as an authority we will take it and we will adopt it other than that chairman thank you for that opportunity Thank you, Committee. You've uh, heard those uh, comments uh, from Highways, if you would like to take that on board. Are there any other questions of a technical nature for either the case officer or Highways? Then, before I open the debate, members, may I remind you to direct any questions or remarks through the chair, and I will invite members to speak in turn. Can I also remind members to speak directly into the microphones, which should be kept on mute when not speaking, to preserve audio quality? I now open the debate to members. Councillor Worth, Chairman. Councillor Worth, you're up first. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I know we've heard extensively from the highways about the situation on the, with regard to the speed limit, but I would encourage um, our colleagues on Weymouth Town Council, as that was suggested as part of the highways uh, words, uh, to pursue um, a lower speed limit on this road. Um, currently, 40 miles an hour is acceptable because there, are, there is only a farm access coming out onto that road. We're now going to have two other access roads, um, and that farm access road will be used as, a, as an entry onto that road. It is a fast road. It, is, um, it has had a fatal accident not in recent past. Um, where there are residential properties along that road, it is 30 miles an hour. I see no reason why that can't be extended for the extent of uh, that road up until the roundabout at the far end. Um, and that, as I say, is my comment. But I would, I would encourage Weymouth Town Council to pursue that as a separate matter. Thank you. Who's next to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, I find myself in a very strange situation of actually agreeing with Councillor O'Leary. I'm, I'm sure it won't happen often. The, the, the suggestions he put forward <coughs> seems eminently sensible to me, and I find it incredibly frustrating that this committee lacks the power to insist upon them. Um, I accept there's nothing we can do about it, I'm, but nevertheless, I think overall I feel that when it comes down to this, a gun's pointed over our head and we're powerless. But nevertheless, I accept that the design in itself is probably acceptable to me. Thank you. 
Councillor Bolwell, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Of course, what one has to bear in mind that, in fact, we are dealing with reserve matters. Some of these issues should have been dealt with during the outline planning um, procedure. So, uh, so we are, we are, where we are. Who did we say was... Uh, Councillor Bolwell, Chairman. Councillor Bolwell. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, apart from my misgivings over the, uh, the highways, I don't really have much of an issue with, with the, uh, the design and the layout, etc., of, of uh, this housing estate. I think it's actually quite good, uh, if, except the fact it's uh, already got um, agreement in principle. So um, as it stands, I will probably be looking favourably on this, even though I still have misgivings about the, <laughs> the speed and the crossings. Thank you. Do I detect in there, in fact, that you're, doing, you're making a proposal? Uh, yes, Chair. <laughs> I'm now seeking a seconder, please. Uh, thank you. That uh, uh, the uh, committee voted unanimously in favour, and therefore this particular item is passed. Thank you very much indeed for your indulgence. Right, thank you, committee. Okay, we'll now take item 5B on the agenda, and that's the application number PFUL 2022-03801, and that's Weymouth Angling Society, Commercial Road, Weymouth, DT4, 8NF. And that's the, to erect an extension to form a cellar. I now invite uh, Katrina Trevett, the planning officer, to introduce this item. Over to you, Katrina. Thank you. Yes, this application relates to um, a very small extension, actually, on the Weymouth Angling Society Club building on Commercial Road in Weymouth. Um, the extension has been described as a cellar, but it's, it's more an external store, um, which is located on, on the very front porch area. This is the application site. It's close to the main, well, as you can see, directly opposite the main Weymouth Arena, here um, to the west with the uh, former Debenhams, now the range building to the east. Um, and the, the club building kind of sits on its own, um, adjacent to the main highway and adjacent to public car parking. This is just an aerial view of that club building. So you can see the, the small porch extension actually on, on the front of the building there. Um, and this is where the external store cellar um, extension is to be erected. The proposed extension, you can see it here in brown on the front of the club building, will be erected over existing paving area. It will be constructed in brick and GRP roof. Um, 
and uh, will measure 2.6 meters by 2.5 meters depth and three meters high. You can see here the external access to the front of that cellar area. And here you can see the front elevation of the club building. This is the existing to the bottom here. So this is the existing elevation on the bottom. And then this is the, the newly extended kind of front porch area to provide that external store. There's been no objections. Um, it's considered that there is no harm to the Weymouth uh, Town Centre conservation area from this very small extension. This is just the side profile of that extension. So the, so the existing um, extract cooling equipment that was previously on the side of the port will be moved. Um, so, uh, you know, it will facilitate the, the new external store cellar area as well. So in terms of the main issues, it's located within the Weymouth DDB. It's very small scale. Um, it will be an, uh, a good addition to um, the local recreational facility that the Angling Society Club actually brings to the town. So it's in full support with Policy Com 4. Um, in terms of uh, scale design um, impact on character and appearance, it's considered to be acceptable. It will be in matching materials, modest, appropriate, um, in full compliance. In terms of amenity, there's no um, nearby neighbours, as you could see from the aerial photo and the plans provided. Wider landscape impact, it's within the urban area, so seen in the backdrop of all of that built development. Uh, heritage assets, it is within the conservation area. However, given the small-scale nature of the extension and the matching materials, it's considered that no harm is presented to that conservation area. And obviously there will be the short-term benefits in terms of the economy from the construction employment, but obviously the benefits to that recreational facility um, from improving their accommodation basically and, and the needs for that club. Access and parking will not be significantly, um, well, it won't be affected at all actually. So the impact will be neutral. It is within a high risk flood area. They've submitted a flood risk assessment detailing flood prevention measures which will be conditioned as part of any um, subsequent uh, approval, if approved by committee. Other matters, the impact on the triple SI is considered to be neutral um, in terms of biodiversity. It's very small scale and within the, the, um, the accepted site already. Again, highway safety, as I've already touched upon, impact is neutral. Therefore, we are recommending that the committee grant planning permission subject to a three-year implementation condition, approved plans, and flood resilience measures um, to be installed and carried out prior to first use of the uh, cellar extension. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina, that, uh, that, uh, th and thank you for standing in for the case officer. Are there any questions of a technical nature for the planning officer, please? Councillor Dunseith, Chairman. Councillor Dun Dunseith, over to you. Chairman, um, it says erect extension to form a cellar. From what I've seen, it's, it's um, an extension to almost the porch area. Is that correct? Thank you, Chairman. So, yes, it is an extension to the porch. Area. Yes. It will actually have its own external access and it's um, supposed to be like a cold store. Um, they are like a club building, so they wouldn't store alcohol, et cetera, which they would be in this external cellar, basically. Right, so I think it was um, that I didn't quite understand what cellar referred to because. I wondered whether you would be excavating beneath this, but not. Thank you. So, um, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I know, I know. I did, 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 uh, Cancer Island, Chairman. Cancer Island. Yeah, sorry, just for clarification, a cellar is defined by the dictionary as a room below ground level in a house often used for storing wine or coal. So um, I think Councillor Dunseith is correct in assuming it should be down below ground. 
<laughs> Councillor Ireland is quite right, but of course these days uh, cellars, which are often used by uh, by uh, public houses, or quite often are on the same level as the bar itself. Yeah. So I, I think therefore that meaning doesn't apply. But thank you for that, uh, Councillor Ireland. <laughs> Okay, in that case then, if there's no other deliberation and members are content, they've heard the entire presentation debate, I now seek a proposal and a seconder to, and a vote for a share of hands. Uh, Councillor O'Leary. Yep, I see no issue with this. I'd like to propose that we accept this. Did you actually go to the debate, debate Chairman? We have technical questions. We haven't had the debate yet. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, actually, I was going to do the same as Councillor O'Leary. Uh, I, don't, I don't think this one needs debating, personally, um, apart from the location of above or below ground cellar, which is probably irrelevant, but um, interesting all the same. So um, I'm happy to second Councillor O'Leary's proposal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's, um, that is uh, taken uh, by a vote by a show of hands and is a unanimous decision on the part of the committee. Right, we now take item, uh, before we take item 5C, um, Councillor Kelvin Clayton has declared a, a predetermination on this particular item and he wishes to speak, so I'm asking him to move to the public area if he will be so kind. Right. And, uh, and you're just not taking part, are you? Right. Okay. Okay. All right. <coughs> okay. This item, item 5C, application number PFUL 2021-04548, Weight Chosen Partners, 42 and 44 West Street, Bridport, DT6 3QP. And that's for the removal of existing boundary and internal walls and creation of six and number parking spaces for home delivery vans and associated electric charging points, two and number customer collection parking spaces and two and number taxi waiting spaces. I again um, uh, invite uh, uh, Katrina Trevet, a planning officer, to introduce this item. Over to, over to you. Yes, this application relates to Waitrose and Partners in Bridport, who I think we can all agree is a, a very important um, employer within the town. They've been central within the town centre for a number of years um, in a very publicly viewable site as well and accessed um, being opposite a main, uh, main car park within the town um, and off of the main uh, West Street access. So this application seeks to basically reorganize um, and redevelop the rear service yard to the main um, shopping uh, superstore in Bridport uh, by the creation of six parking spaces for home delivery vans, including six electrical car charging or van charging um, associated equipment with, the, with each of those spaces as well as uh, two number customer collection parking spaces and two number taxi waiting spaces. Um, there will be the erection of a freestanding canopy in the loading bay area, replacement trolley and staff shelters and associated development, including uh, the, the way that the, the site is accessed by the traffic, et cetera, and just kind of reformalizing that space. So, as I mentioned, a very key site within Bridport Town Centre. Uh, you can see the red line here. It's actually um, the surface area is accessed off of rope walks to the rear. There is a public footpath that leads from the public car park, which is just opposite here off of rope walks and leads through to West Street. So there are, there's a number of the public either, you know, utilising that footpath to go through to the town 
or to go to Waitrose supermarket itself. It is very visual within the Bridport conservation area. Here's just a close up of that red line area of the block plan. And you can start to see um, the area that's kind of enclosed at the moment. So it's, it's this kind of green space that's bounded by walls, which I'll show you in a moment, which um, are historic uh, Burgage medieval walls, actually, as part of the original kind of town form and layout. So here's an aerial view of the site. And again, you can see the existing service yard area at the moment um, and how the Burgage walls actually intrude in that um, currently at the moment. Obviously, they were there before, but uh, yeah. So that's how it remains at the moment. You can see the public car park um, and the footpath um, that leads through on the um, eastern side past the superstore there. Here is a, a photo street scene of, of the Burgage walls that are still in place at the moment. Now, obviously, as part of the reorganisation of this service yard area, they're seeking to completely uh, remove the Burgage walls, which, um, you know, this is a matter for debate, really, in that the conservation officer considers them to be non-designated heritage assets. Um, they are clearly um, referenced within the Bridport conservation area of being um, of historic, um, historic importance where development should be controlled or sensitively enhanced. Um, they are not within the list of local de non-designated heritage assets as part of the Bridport neighbourhood plan, although reference is made, obviously, again, to that, to that heritage of how Bridport has developed. Um, however, they don't need to be on the local list to actually be considered non-designated heritage assets. That is our professional view on the matter. We consider them to have some heritage importance. However, um, we do accept that in order for, for Waitrose to you know, be able to move forward with this site, um, and obviously is a very important kind of commercial business for the town centre, you know, there, there is negotiation on this side. So let's just um, run over the plans in terms of how, that's, how that service area is going to be developed. So um, you can see that the walls, the, the outline of those walls are completely removed um, and the six space is brought forward for the van deliveries. I think the next plan better shows that in terms of the taxi waiting spaces here directly off of rope walks. Um, you've also got the two customer collection parking spaces so we take on the point about better accessibility um, for the town and for people wanting to access the store and also the, the efficiency of the business from having the, um, you know, being able to formally park and, and use the, the home delivery vans and not, you know, it not be as probably chaotic as it is in that service yard at the moment because you've got that bur burgage wall kind of layout dead set in the middle of it. We understand that. Um, the advice that's come forward from conservation in terms of this is that they are willing to accept the loss of the Burgage walls and they are willing to accept that there is, you know, there's some compromise in terms of how this site goes forward. Um, however, it's the way that it's been carried out that we have concerns about. You know, this is within the designated heritage asset, which is the conservation area. We consider those walls to be non-designated heritage assets which means that any um, removal and replacement should be either preserving or enhancing. The test of the conservation area is that, you know, development preserves or enhances the site. And this is, this is the key as to why we don't consider this project to do that, in that, you know, they're seeking to remove those walls of benefit to the service yard area, which we completely we agree. However, they're looking to replace it with very utilitarian, basic timber fencing at 2.4 metres high. Um, and what we dispute is that Waitrose have, Waitrose have commented that actually the project would be unviable if it could not continue forward in this manner. Um, however, we would argue that there has been no viability assessment or evidence submitted Will Waitrose Superstore pull out of the town as a result of negotiating on maybe reusing some of the brick and stone, maybe getting a better finish on that, on that, you know, 
the boundary kind of treatment that they wish? Um, I suspect not. Um, but we have no evidence um, to, to counteract with that, so it's an unclear argument. We often say about being backed into a corner in terms of accepting less than ideal kind of finishes and being pushed, you know, to accept something that's actually unacceptable and isn't of, you know, of high quality that we would seek for that conservation area, very public location. And unfortunately, again, it feels like we're being pushed into a corner because of Waitrose being an important employer you know, and, and being a key, a, a key kind of supermarket within the town. However, they're obviously willing to invest in the site to reorganise the service yard, to develop that, you know, the home delivery um, option for the business and, and actually kind of improve things for the town. We're just saying, let's negotiate a bit more. Let's get a better finish on that very utilitarian that isn't going to age very well timber fencing and the polycarbonate um, the polycarbonate um, canopy that you can actually see in that picture as well behind you know let's get materials that that actually reflect the high status of the conservation area we saw in that previous photo let me take you back there that you know it's not visually appealing as it is so why should we accept something that kind of carries on that you know the poor visual nature of that site let's try and get an you know get an uh, an improvement if we can um improvement sorry and you know work with waitrose to to meet halfway and negotiate just on those materials um the only uh point that we have been able to agree on is that actually um waitrose are now willing to put up an information plaque to denote the, the history of the site. Um, so that's, that's something that they have taken on board. We're just saying a little bit further, let's try and improve those finish, you know, the finished quality and the materials accepted for that. We're absolutely willing to compromise on that point. Um, and I just want to further reflect on, on this plan. There's all these little red stars that you can see. That, you know, that's the amount of um, designated heritage assets surrounding that site. The entire conservation area is a designated heritage asset. It's completely enclosed by that historic character and quality. And therefore, we should be seeking, as per our policies, in the neighbourhood plan, in um, you know, the local plan, national policies, improvements the test is where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designate a designated heritage asset this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal we see many public benefits we absolutely agree but we also think that we shouldn't have to be backing down on seeking quality development that's not what our plan structure and policies seek so therefore um just in terms of the main issues, it is within the Bridport DDB. It's supported by Policy SUS2 and Policy Econ4, um, which states that retail and town centre development should be appropriate in type and scale to the particular centre and its catchment population. Uh, the, obviously, reflecting back on that main issue about the committee needing to weigh up the impact and harm to designated and non-designated heritage assets, as I've talked about, um, versus the climate change agenda and the inclusion of the electrical charging points and, you know, better organisation of that space and the public being able to have better accessibility. Now, the suggested changes by the conservation team, so this was just going back to what I said in terms of negotiation points, is that you know, they feel that all the proposed close boarding fencing on site needs to be replaced with low brick wall in traditional materials, including utilising the existing inner brick walls where feasible. Again, it's a negotiation point, but what we would say is try and use more appropriate materials in terms of finishing this site. The inclusion of the signage plaque, well, we've obviously, that's been agreed and that's something that would be taken forward. Uh, making good the site's far eastern boundary wall, 
and full details including demolition works, material samples and scale finish method of fixing for the proposed plaque. Again, that would be, you know, um, if a later approval came through, then that's something that could be agreed. Impact on amenity, well, it's very kind of, <laughs> it's enclosed within the site, uh, basically. It will result in actually an enhancement of amenity for those using, you know, wanting to gain the spaces. And again, we're not, you know, we're not concerned with actually, we can see the benefits of removing that non-designated heritage walls and actually improving how that service yard works and in terms of improving those spaces and, and the accessibility for customers. The landscape view is very much in that urban context. It's within the centre of Bridport, so therefore there is no significant AOMB impact from this scheme. Economic benefits, obviously the short-term benefits from construction employment and improvements to business efficiency. And highway safety, uh, Waitrose have worked on the plans to ensure that you know, the access and parking as kind of reorganised through this entire project um, is acceptable to the highway authority. So having obviously discussed at length about the impact um, that we feel there is on the conservation area from, from having to accept something that's of lesser standard um, that we would often even refuse on a residential dwelling, let alone you know, a large-scale site in the middle of a conservation area um, because of the nature of timber fencing um, and its utilitarian and kind of barricading appearance a very basic finish. Um, we are looking to refuse this application based on the refusal reason um, that was within the committee report. Um, and there we go. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. I now invite uh, Simon Gregory, representative from Waitrose and Partners, to address the committee. Please speak directly into the microphone. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, yes, as, as you say, Simon Gregory, um, one of the estate managers for John Lewis Partnership, and I look after this part of the country in terms of Waitrose and John Lewis stores. Um, I think a lot of the points have already been mentioned, so it's sort of <laughs> some of the things I was going to say. But um, yes, we've been in the town for 13 years, and you can see why we're very keen to, to put this investment in. Um, into the branch. And perhaps to give you a bit of rationale um, for this, um, post-COVID, the pattern of trade for our customers has, has changed considerably. And so effectively, lots of parts of lots of areas of rural Wiltshire, um, Dorset rather, have, um, uh, have really, there's a big demand for um, home deliveries. And we are currently... 279%, I think it is, nearly threefold uh, increase in our customers' desire for home deliveries post-COVID. So we're trying to satisfy the needs of our, our customers. And um, as well as the delivery vans, which, as you, as you can see, are uh, environmentally friendly, um, the click and collect aspect as well um, would also help with um, uh, customer benefit and also the taxi rank um, that we would be dedicating back to the town council um, might, to a small degree, help congestion within the, the town council, uh, for the town, rather. Um, benefits, I think, threefold, really, economic, environmental, and visually, which um, the officer has, has effectively mentioned, but to, um, to secure our future in the town, um, to obviously have the benefit of linked trips from other people visiting our store and also going to other, other shops within the town and other uh, amenities. Environmentally, uh, the six EV charging points and the taxi rank, as I've mentioned. Visually, there would be, as you can see and has been outlined, new surfacing, um, pedestrian walkway, trolley bays, fresh signage and uh, heritage plaque, um, which, is, which was just raised. In terms of the wall itself, um, our structural and civil engineers had a very extensive feasibility study looking at the actual material and how much historic brickwork exists in these walls. And it's their conclusion um, that was, there was a very insufficient amount of re reusable bricks um, in actual 
reality. So whilst it appears from the photograph that this is a very historic wall, the actual reality of the matter, according to their inspection and analysis, is that actually there's not that, that much in, in the actual walls of historic and heritage value. Um, a lot of the other points have been talked about, but I think in conclusion, I think there's the, the risk of losing the benefits that, we, that I've sort of ha briefly highlighted. And as was mentioned, there's no objections from highways, environmental health, town council support. Um, the economic factor as well, I think the, the, the purchase of the land that we're looking at is one sixth of the cost of what we would need to do to, um, to deliver this wall. So it, it's on its own merits, something that wouldn't get through our approval process. Um, so for that, that reason, we, we wouldn't appeal or we wouldn't, wouldn't go any further. So, but I think on balance, as you say, it's, planning is very much about balance and I think it would be probably unjust uh, in terms of the public benefit to leave this land as it is and for us not to, to move forward. But we would be happy to have further discussions, which was raised today in terms of a possible and different solution. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, thank, thank you for that. Mr. Gregory. Okay. And I no, he doesn't want to speak. No, he won't. Well, and yeah, because we're another speaker. Yeah. Um, I also invite uh, Councillor Kelvin Clayton, board member for Bridport, to address the committee. Again, you have three minutes. Over to uh, Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wish to support in wish to speak in support of this application. In summary, the planning officer's report recommends refusal because, as we've heard. The proposed development would result in less than substantial harm to the character, appearance and significance of the Bridport Conservation Area that is not outweighed by the public benefit. Personally, I don't think the issue here is the weighing of harm against the public benefit. The crucial question is whether any harm is done by the proposal in the first place. If there is no harm, there is nothing to weigh against and no reason to refuse. Let me start with the character and appearance. Oh, by the way, the photograph shown is substantially out of date. Um, the site is effectively a piece of overgrown wasteland with some crumbling old walls. From the perspective of the by no means attractive tarmac car park, immediately behind the site is the Waitrose store, a modern building. Immediately to the left is a flower shop at the head of a residential block, also of modern design. If you then turn to your right, the first thing you see is a large modern extension to the rear of another shop with an ugly corrugated roof and end wall. I fail to see how the proposal could in any way harm either the character or the appearance of this view. Let me now turn to significance. Time and time again, we are, we, proposals are rejected because it is claimed that proposal causes less than substantial harm to the significance of a heritage asset. But we are rarely, if ever, given a statement as to what that significance actually is. Both the NPPF and Historic England define significance as the value of a heritage asset to this and future generations because of its heritage interest. Who determines the value the current generation of Bridport residents attach to their heritage assets? When was the last time the residents of Bridport were consulted? In the absence of such a consultation, it must surely be down to the valuation of the town council. I would be very surprised if local residents attached any value at all to the proposal site and its old walls. I therefore genuinely fail to see how any significance could be attached to this site, let alone how that significance could be harmed. In my opinion, no harm will be done to the character, appearance and significance of the Bridport Conservation Area by this proposal. If the committee agrees, it has no reason to refuse. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you, uh, Councillor Clayton. I call on Katrina Trevor to respond with any salient points she may wish to clarify. Thank you, Chair. There's only um, there's only a couple of points really to respond to in terms of that when an application is submitted with it, when it's within the conservation area, a heritage statement is requested to be submitted, which should um, obviously detail um, the significance of of the site and and you know how the proposal will, will impact on that. Um, in terms of uh, just um, clarifying Councillor Kate. Clayton's comments in terms of, of failing to see the significance of the area. So obviously acknowledging that that is within the Bridport conservation area, but potentially that it that it shouldn't be. Is is that the point? In that, you know, obviously the conservation area is a designated heritage asset, and therefore the entire area is designated of having historic importance. Um, you've said yourself about some of the um, modern development that kind of borders the site. However, that doesn't set precedent for then employing um, further inappropriate development and finish within a central conservation area site. Um, and that's what I just wanted to, to confirm on those points. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, are there any questions of a technical nature for the planning officer, or indeed highways? Councillor Dancy, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Have we, as Dorset Council, or the conservation section, the environmental section, have you looked at the wall in detail and done any, done any analysis of the wall because it could be medieval but also it could, it could just be something that over time people have um, put new bricks or new stones on. In actual fact the 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 actual stones or the actual wall itself may not be medieval, although standing on a medieval boundary. Thank, thank you, Councillor Dunsey. Could I ask you to reply, please? Thank you, Councillor Dunsey. Um, we have, well, obviously the conservation officer has been out to site and reviewed the walls. Um, it was put to the applicant to provide that study of, you know, the material of the walls, which they've carried out as part of our, our concern about obviously losing um, the walls as part of this application. However, you know, based on those findings, we have accepted that the walls can be removed. So there's kind of that part of the argument in terms of we accept that they will be taken down and we've agreed that, you know, an information plaque will be erected at site to, to mention about the walls and obviously the, the history that, that came from that. It's just now the second part of that story in terms of we now look at the harm to the designated heritage asset from what they are now proposing as that replacement. And what we're saying is, is that we, we consider those walls to be not to be non-designated heritage assets. They are being removed. We should seek a development that will preserve and enhance the conservation area. And it's primarily the timber fencing that we would wish to, you know, negotiate on um, further with Waitrose, even in terms of lessening it um, or incorporating uh, a different material. Um, throughout just to break it up so it's not you know it's not such blank utilitarian imposing and kind of you know completely um, just swallowing the site almost in terms of visually just because of the extent of it um, it's quite a harsh boundary treatment we would not recommend it for any um, designated um, heritage asset curtilages or within um, the conservation area, which is a designated heritage asset in itself. So that's the point. Thank you. 
Thank you. Does that uh, answer your question? Thank, thank you, Chairman. I, I just wondered how the conversations went and whether there was any give on this by the applicants. historical plaque being put at site, you know, and, and they put forward their, their argument that basically the entire project would not be viable if um, they could not carry it out as they wished. However, no viability assessment or evidence came in on that basis to actually prove that to us. Um, and so, you know, accepting the project as is, Waitrose are a national company this site is clearly important to them, and, and that's what we're kind of saying, that with very little kind of extra investment, we could have a much better finish here, you know, that would be to the benefit of all, basically. And actually, we will have developed that service area um, successfully in the end, uh, because we all see the benefits of it. You know, it's, it's something that we would wish to encourage, but done properly. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Cantina. I now have a technical question from the Vice Chairman of the two bill. Thank you, Chairman. C Katrina, it, it, it seems here we have a, uh, an application with a recommendation for refusal. And it's just sort of dawned on me, why didn't we have um, a recommendation for acceptance or granting the permission for the, for the uh, proposal uh, with conditions that would uh, well, then enhance the site how we want it. Thank you for that. I'll hand that back to Katrina. Thank you. That would be cast as unreasonable. Um, so, you know, the applicants, <laughs> the applicants have, have made their case in terms of what's proposed and what's shown on the plans. Um, and therefore that, you know, that's what we are considering in terms of that finish. Um, and there has not been a, a there hasn't been a, a negotiation meeting point in terms of in terms of that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Worth you just yeah. Councillor Worth. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I'm just trying to get. It is technical. I'm trying to get this my head around this. So there is no objection to the walls being removed. The objection is. The fence that replace or surrounds the site is—is is that clear? Have I got that right in my head? Any other technical questions? Uh, no, Chairman. Okay. Right on the right on the hammer. Okay. 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 okay, okay. In view of my prompting, um, I now open the debate to members. Over to uh, Councillor Leary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, there's just a few things. Um, in regard to the actual wall, I mean, the current one looks like someone at the last fight of the OK Corral. I mean, it's an, uh, hardly an uh, appetising-looking thing. We're not discussing a, a statue, a historic monument. At the end of the day, we're talking about a wall behind a supermarket. I... In regards to the, I mean, I was very refreshing to hear an officer talk about the pressure put on us as a planning authority by big companies. However, I don't think Waitrose, I think Waitrose is the least of our worries in that regards. Um, I just think I, I, if Waitrose want to do this, it's very good. It's clearly a very important asset to the town. We can't make them do it as Councillor Pipe recommended because it would be class and reasonable. If that's the case, then that's unreasonable. Therefore, I would just propose that we accept this application and have what it is. We've come to a compromise with the plaque. I don't think this is the end of the world. Um, so therefore, I'd like to make an, a proposal to accept this application. I will just declare a very quick interest. I did lend the um, applicant spokesperson my pen, but I was unaware of who he was at the time. Right, 
propose acceptance to Uh, now that's where I was. That, that's where I wanted to be clarification because the, the the proposal was to refuse the development. I, I propose, Chairman, that we refuse refusal. Refuse the, refuse the officer's recommendation to propose refusal of this application. And let's get on. Right, You're right. voting, in fact. Okay, I'm going to actually, in view of that proposal, which I haven't yet had a seconder for, I am going to go hand back to Anne, who will actually clarify a few points of order. Chair, we would need a clear reason as to why um, there is a proposal for approval on the table before us. Um, and if we were to get to say as a seconder, and we had a clear reason we vote on it, we'd need an adjournment in terms of preparing any conditions as well, Chair, please. Can I, can I see, in view of that proposal that's on the floor, uh, is there a seconder for it? Uh, five seconders. <laughs> uh, who, who is first, is it? Uh, I, 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 I would take Councillor Worth, Chairman. Right, OK. Cancer Island. Thank you, Chairman. Um, when I read this, I was initially quite conflicted because I, I, I didn't know what a Borage plot was, and so I did some research. And it turns out there's actually a website called borageplots.info, and they were basically agricultural things for towns, essentially, which are associated with buildings. But as you can see, um, the building it was associated with is long gone and is now a modern supermarket. And you know, the report says it's fine for the wall to go down. You know, it's, it's probably just a, a pile of rock and you know, infill. Um, and our council has no objection, our officer has no objection to it going down. So I can't really see any objection to it at all. Um, I visited there a couple of months ago to meet Councillor Williams in the pub um, just up the road. And it's a car park. Um, it's it's a service yard. It's backs of shops. It's you know it's it's it's, it's it is what it is. It's, it serves its purpose, and it's not, in my view, anything worth keeping. Um, if uh, Miss Miss Collins is looking for a re refusal, and the whole thing is um, it's all subjective, isn't it? As Councillor Caton pointed out, it's we never hear. There's never any definitive saying this is X, this is Y, this is why you can't do it. it it's all a matter of opinion, and I think. The, the, the gentleman from Waitrose has indicated that he's willing to maybe negotiate slightly on the fence. So I, I would go ahead with, you know, Councillor O'Leary's proposal of, you know, refusing the refusal. Wherever, I'm completely confused myself now as well. But, you know, with the condition that some negotiation has taken place with the applicant to, to make it look a bit less rubbish. Okay, so we've got a proposal to grant, uh, grant permission. Um, I'm going to actually bring in our lawyer for the moment, who is keen to say a few words. Thank you, Chair. So to remove the double negatives, I think Councillor Lira's proposal was to grant planning permission. Um, in order to do that, as proposer, Councillor Lira needs to give clear reasons for that, which take into account the Council's statutory duty to give great weight to uh, enhancing or preserving the conservation area. So I think from, from the debate I've heard, you need, you need almost at the start to disaggregate the wall from the conservation area. You need to determine whether there is in fact um, harm or not to the conservation area from the proposal that is before you, bearing in mind the advice that you've had from the case officer and conservation officer that, that less than substantial harm would be caused by the development. Um, when you're then when you've attached great weight to that as part of the weighing exercise you need to put into that balance whether you consider there is benefit or, or harm by removing the non-designated heritage as heritage asset and then you need to consider whether there are public benefits which outweigh sorry if you determine that the proposal would cause harm um, to the conservation area you then need to 
consider whether there would be substantial public benefits which outweigh that harm. Of course, it's open to you to determine that there would be no harm to the conservation area, but you'd need to explain why. Thank you, Chair. Councillor okay, O'Leary, can you uh, expand on your original proposal? I shall give it a go. Um, I believe that this committee feels that the economic um, benefits of this development outweigh the costs or the possible cost it would have on the heritage uh, asset site. Um, sorry, through, through you, Chair. I think the, the, the first step that you need to go through is to determine whether or not the proposal causes harm to the conservation area with reasons for that. And if you consider that it, it does cause harm, then you need significant public benefits to outweigh that. If you consider there's no harm, then, then you need to explain why that is. And what flows from that is you, it would be a normal planning balancing exercise without significant weight, because there would be no harm. I personally do not feel that this application poses any harm. Instead, I believe that it would provide significant um, positives, benefits to businesses within the local area. So therefore, I do not believe that there are, in my opinion, any negatives. And anybody who would be supporting my um, proposal would be in agreement with that. I'm going to hand, hand back to, uh, to a lawyer who's keen to respond to that. Thank you, Chair. I, I think we just need a little bit more from Councillor O'Leary about why he considers, the, on the proposal that's before them, that no harm is caused to the conservation area. Thank you, Chair. I'll take that back to Councillor O'Leary, then I'll take some other speakers. Thank you. I do not believe it poses any negative benefit, uh, any negative, oh, I'm getting confused now, any, any substantive negative impact in the area because at the end of the day, this is a service yard. It is not a public park. It's not an area of amenities. Like I say, we're not dealing with a historical monument or a statue. The area it is in is used for business and therefore this application would enhance that i do not believe it would therefore have any negative impact in terms of conservation in that area i'm going to ask a question of myself did i hear from the presentations on this particular item that in fact by accommodating the taxi ranks in the car park behind the him uh, behind uh, uh, the, the shop would actually ease the congestion on the associated uh, um, taxi ranks within the town. In other words, would it relieve pressure on other areas within the town? Thank you, Chair. No, I didn't actually express that comment within the presentation, um, and I believe that we haven't actually had any guidance in in terms of that i think it's just acknowledged that obviously by providing to taxi collection points at the back of the store it's bound to have some um you know reduction in terms of people going to the front of the store at the existing rank to be able to 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 get a taxi so i think that's inevitable um but it's not been a point that has been um, needed to be clarified, to be fair. Thank you. We, Councillor, uh, uh, the Vice Chairman wishes to speak now. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it appears to me, uh, Chairman, that, you know, if, if Councillor O'Leary's made his declaration that there is no uh, bad impact, if you like, on on the erection of, of the uh, wooden fence, then perhaps it might um, be fine to make 
the, the actual wooden fence, a temporary structure to be actually replaced by a, by, by a brick wall. Yeah. Maybe. Go ahead, yeah. Um, I, I believe the oh, oh. I believe the wall is associated within the car park, in the centre of the car park, and not surrounding fence. But uh, but I'm going to hand that back to Anne. Over to you. There would be no. Um, it wouldn't be reasonable for us to say that the fence can be a. If if, if it's accepted, the fence has no harm by committee members. There would be no justification for making the fence a temporary feature condition to be replaced at a later date. I think what members need to consider today is, is the fence acceptable to them, having regard to the points that um, the lawyer has made with regard to those considerations. If it is, that's what you're voting on. If it's not acceptable, then you'd be looking to refuse it, and that's when we'd then be in a strong position to negotiate an alternative scheme with the applicants. Right, bearing that in mind, I think uh, that there is a proposal there to, to accept the development uh, going ahead. And because of that, I'm going to adjourn the committee for a few moments and to allow the officers to actually come up with the formal words and conditions which would satisfy, uh, which would satisfy the, uh, the meeting. Yep. Uh, just, just quickly, Chairman, the sec seconder of, of Councillor O'Leary's uh, suggestion wishes to speak. Um, yes, I don't think that it's been demonstrated that there would be substantial harm to a non-designated heritage asset. And in that respect, I think that any harm that is um, potentially there is far outweighed by the public benefit of having an, an enhanced development for a local amenity which is well used. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Our, uh, our lawyer, uh, Phil, would like to come back on that. Thank you, Chair. Just to pick up Councillor Worth's comment, um, the, the issue of our statutory duty, which leads to whether or not something has given great weight to the harm, doesn't relate to the undesignated heritage asset, which is the wall. It relates to any harm or not to the conservation area, which is a designated heritage asset, and therefore it's one that we have a statutory duty to give great weight to preserving or maintaining. So, so that's the that's the split. Just for clarification, the, the statutory duty applies to the conservation area, not to the wall itself. But the wall is within the conservation area. Thank you. Uh, do you wish to come back on that, uh, Councillor Worth? Yes, I don't consider it, it shows substantial harm to the heritage asset in any way. I think it, that is outweighed by um, the benefit to the, uh, the wider community. Thank you. I, I believe that uh, Anne would like to come back in now. Would you? Just to clarify, in terms of the test for the conservation area, which is a designated heritage asset, it's not does it do substantial harm, it does it do no harm. It's only if there's no harm could members be looking to approve this. If it was less than substantial harm, then there would need to be some significant overriding public benefit. And if there was substantial harm, it would need to be refused. It could not be overcome. Councillor O'Leary. It is my belief it causes no harm. An amendment to your. No, no. no that's, that's, the re that's the reason. Yeah, yeah, John, did you. Uh, Councillor Worth, are you in agreement, you being the second, are you in agreement with those that, that statement regarding the proposal? Uh, I'm entirely in agreement with that proposal. I think it does, doesn't demonstrate any harm. No harm is demonstrated. Thank you. Councillor Cooking. Yeah, I, I agree with Councillor O'Leary and Councillor Worth. It doesn't cause any harm, but it, causes, it, it gives a great public um, benefit, uh, the, the amenity 
that Waitrose are offering gives a better amenity to the general public in Bridport and wider on because it gives them click and collect. Taxi makes the site more accessible for everyone, better car parking, mm -hmm. so that it improves the amenity of the area for the general public. And electricity charging. We're supposed to be a council that's encouraging climate change and they're um, proposing six electric charging points as well. So I think there's, it's all round a winner for everyone. Right, I think we need to adjourn in order to get a formal word before we go put it to the committee for, to vote. So I therefore, 10 minutes? 20. 20 minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Three? Five. So it's five. Five. Uh, five. Five. Five.
Do we need a roll call? Don't need a roll call. We're all here. Just, just, just confirm that everybody's present. Everyone back present? Yes? Yeah. Yep. If you're not here, please shout. <laughs> okay. Um, um, we have a form of words which, uh, which uh, the officers have looked at and which has come up with their various conditions. And I'm going to go back to, to Katrina to expand on, on uh, exactly what those are. And the, they are as listed on the screen. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we're just... Um, so the conditions we're suggesting is the standard time limit condition, plans list condition, obviously to agree the approved plans, uh, the information plaque that we've talked about in terms of detailing the history of the site, uh, the proposed fencing finish to ensure it's an appropriate finish um, and maintained as such thereafter. Turning, parking and manoeuvring, obviously with the reorganisation of the service yard and, and the traffic coming in and out. Uh, we want to make sure it's in accordance with the plans that um, are to be agreed. Uh, the electrical vehicle charging installation, obviously that's a planning benefit that we want to secure and also the taxi ramp provision as well as another benefit that the committee would seek to ensure goes ahead. Thank you. Oh, and uh, just to mention, can we please um, delegate authority to the service manager for development management and enforcement in consultation with the chairman to agree wording of the conditions as stated? Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Councillor Leary and, and Councillor, well, have, you, have you heard that and have you seen the conditions as laid out? Uh, are you in agreement with that? Uh, yes, Chairman, I am. Yes. Don't need to take a vote then. I've been asked to actually, because of the changes, that in fact you, your proposition to approve is. Uh, is actually restated. It's very kind of you, but um, so it was just it was just to clarify for for members of the public and that and that the proposal on the and to the members of the committee more importantly that the proposal on the table is to approve the application subject to the headline conditions headline conditions that are on the screens and that authority to um for the detailed wording of those conditions is delegated to the service manager in consultation with the chairman of this committee i was i was just confirming what i understood to be on on the table so if you disagree, say now. If not, that's fine. Okay, committee, you've heard that, uh, that uh, proposal condition as stated for delegating decision to the service manager and, uh, and myself uh, uh, and uh, in as laid out on the screen. Everyone in favour? That is unanimous. Right, the committee has voted and it's unanimity in favour of the, in, the laid out terms and conditions and the fact that it will be delegated to the service manager and myself. Committee, we now take item 5D on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the agenda, and that's the application number PFUL 2022-04612, Boat Shed, Boat Park, George Street, West Bay, DT6, 4EY, and that's for the dem demolition of an existing and erection of a replacement boat shed. And I now invite uh, uh, Katrina again. You're busy this morning. Um, uh, to uh, a planning officer to introduce this item. Over to you, Katrina. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I'm hoping slightly more straightforward in terms of this uh, this application. 
Um, this is to do with the Sea, uh, the sea Scouts in uh, Bridport and West Bay. And it's uh, the demolition and replacement of their um, existing boat shed within the boat yard at West Bay. In terms of site location, uh, the existing buildings just off of uh, just off of George Street within West Bay here. Um, you've got the harbour uh, down here to the southwest, and the George Hotel. Um, there are a number of listed buildings actually opposite. You've got the um, Her Majesty's Coast Guard Station just here to the south. You've also got numbers five to eleven George Street, which are also uh, Grade Two listed um, here to the southwest. This is a picture of the of the building of the of the boatyard in green, uh, the existing building here, um, which they are seeking to replace. Uh, the new replacement building will be no higher than the existing ridge height of this building at the moment. Um, all they're seeking to do is actually to raise the eaves, which I will show you on plan at the moment. Uh, in a moment, the um, floor area of the existing building is going to be replicated by the replacement building. So there's no uh, change in terms of the building size on the ground. Um, and this is just a plan which shows you obviously the existing um, heights and eaves heights of the um, of the boat shed currently, and then you've got the proposed changes below. So as you can see, a very modest change simply raising the eaves, um, being 1.6 metres higher on one side and 0.64 metres higher on the other side. Uh, and here's just a, a full elevation plan and floor plan so you can see how that, again, how the building is changing. It's considered that these changes are very modest. Um, it's clearly not going to have a considerable impact in terms of visual um, amenity apart from visually upgrading that building within the West Bay conservation area um, and obviously renewing uh, renewing the material etc um, in terms of neighboring amenity it's well distanced and sited around the corner from the nearest residential neighbor um, and therefore there's considered to be uh, no significant impact it is within the West Bay uh, defined development boundary, supported by, um, therefore, the proposal is supported by Policy SUS2 and COM4, uh, which um, seeks to improve local recreational facilities, which we consider this will do. The scale design and impact on character and appearance of the conservation area and, and in general is considered acceptable, um, like I've said about amenity already. Uh, it's considered that the conservation area will be enhanced and no harm to the setting of the designated heritage as um, assets which are, which are opposite the site, given the overall visual upgrade. Economic benefits, again, short-term benefits from construction employment. Access and parking will not be changing, and it's considered that the um, improved building will not significantly intensify the use of the site either. Uh, flooding measures again have been submitted um, and therefore we are recommending that the committee uh, grants planning permission subject to the conditions three-year implementation approved plans confirmation of external materials color given the overall visual benefits to the conservation area to the recreational facility in terms of upgrading the building and making it more usable um, and resulting in no harm to designated heritage assets. Thank you. Thank you again, Katrina. Are there any questions of a technical nature for the planning officer? I now open the meeting to debate. Have we got anyone wishing to speak? Councillor O'Leary. I see no issues with this development, and I therefore would like to propose the acceptance of this application. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Williams, do you wish to speak? We'll see, Scouts. It's on. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I 
happy to second this proposal. I think it's a visual, will be a visual improvement to the area. And uh, as, as already said, a, a great benefit to the Sea Scouts to have a slightly better building. Do we have any other speakers? This item has been duly proposed and seconded. Um, I'll now take a vote by show of hands. All those in favour? For the benefit of uh, people tuning in from home, the committee has voted unanimously to approve this particular application. Members, committee meetings are limited to three hours duration unless the majority of members present ballot for the meeting to continue. It is therefore necessary to take a vote to resume the meeting beyond that limitation. So I will now take a vote by a show of hands. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. I will close the morning session for lunch. The afternoon session will commence at 1.30.